Hello. Hello, this is Civic Saturday. I'm Janae Kane. Know that you are welcome and that you now belong to a growing Civic Saturday community across the country. This is our first Civic Saturday of 2021, our first Civic Saturday on Zoom, and our first Civic Saturday when we know that Donald Trump will no longer be the president of the United States of America. Another first is a new ritual that we're going to do together at the beginning of each Civic Saturday. I know that the events of the past week and months that I needed to create for myself and share with you a reminder that we have been called to begin our work again, that our, real, our work really doesn't ever end, but we do need time to rest, reflect, and breathe. So now, if you had time to collect a candle, I ask that you get it close to you and something to light it with. If you don't have a candle, perhaps you have a light that you can turn on. And if you don't have a light you can turn on, perhaps you can just turn toward the light or look out the window. And now I'm going to ask you, all of you that are here, it's so, so great to see all of your faces. Um, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and just listen to my voice and together take in a deep breath. Hold it for a few seconds and exhale. Let's do that again. Inhale, hold your breath, and exhale. Keep your eyes closed and continue breathing slowly in and out. And as you begin to relax and release, perhaps let your inhales get deeper and your exhales go longer. Continue breathing with your eyes closed, continuing to relax, and I'm gonna tell you what we're about to do. Civic Saturday is a civic analog to a faith gathering, but it's not about a blind faith in America. Rather, it's a wide-eyed, purposeful faith that democracy and the promise of liberty and justice for all happens because we make it happen. And if that's the case, it takes us coming together in places like this and other civic gatherings to build up our civic muscles together, to instill a faith in ourselves and each other. Breathe in and breathe out. How do we do this? Well, today we're going to do it through ritual, through art, poetry, music. We're going to do it through reflecting on what we call American civic scripture and a civic sermon today given by Eric Liu. And we do that through respectful dialogue, listening, conversation. And today we're bringing back two opportunities to meet one another, to have conversation, a shorter turn and talk, with two or three people early on, and a longer civic circle with a larger group at the end. I hope that sounds good to you. Let's take one more deep breath in, let it out, and open our eyes. So great to be able to open my eyes and see all of you. Now find a piece of paper that I asked you to get and something to write with. And quickly, without thinking too much, I want you to write down three things that you are fearful of right now. Don't think too hard, write them down.
Just use your three second warning that we're moving on. Let's continue again quickly without thinking too hard. Write three things that you are hopeful for right now. Go. All right, I know that was fast, but I just wanted us to take a moment and quickly write these things down without self-censoring because sometimes it's just good to get out our thoughts and fears and our hopes, get them out of our heads into the world where maybe they're not so scary and where perhaps we can do some good. I'm gonna keep my candle burning, but I'm gonna move it. If you need to blow yours out, go right ahead. So what am I fearful of right now? I'm trying to figure out how many times I've opened a Civic Saturday over the last so many years with the phrase, wow, what a week. I know there's been, well, here we are again. Like many Americans, I'm terribly sad and angry right now. If you've been joining us over the past months, you know that in one way I'm doing great. It's three months to the day from when I received my miracle CAR T cell infusion and reversed my terrible cancer relapse and the one that put me back in remission. Physically, I continue to get stronger. I process most of the scary thoughts and feelings that I had during all that uncertainty. And I was just beginning to develop a cautiously optimistic outlook for myself and our country. And then January 6th arrived. And early on, before the horror that unfolded, I texted my sister to see how she was feeling. And I learned, not to my surprise, that she reported that she was feeling excited by the energy and the people who had gathered in DC. Then she told me her husband was there and my stomach started to turn. Soon thereafter, I turned on the television and everything started to turn. As the white supremacist rioters began their assault on the Capitol, I reached out to her again to ask if my brother-in-law was near that building and to please tell me that he wouldn't be a part of what was happening. She assured me with examples of his patriotic bona fides that no, he wasn't near the chaos and he wouldn't do anything like that. I couldn't be so sure. I don't have a real relationship with this brother-in-law of mine, even though we've known each other for three decades but I didn't wish him any harm. And so I texted to ask if he was okay. I didn't hear back. And then the sadness and the anger hit me to my core. I could no longer think about our political differences, the differences in policy ideas, the left right divide, all that had been obliterated by what I was realizing the lies that my brother-in-law and now my sister believed. And no more could I accept her, well, everyone is entitled to their own opinion as an end to our conversations, because where once there might have lived a difference of opinion, now there were only beliefs and lies and conspiracy theories and a deranged desire to follow Trump and Trumpism, no matter where it took them. You won't be shocked to know that when I called her a few days later, it didn't go well. After some misunderstandings through texts and Facebook posts, I just FaceTimed her to remind her that I'm her sister and I'm not trying to spin her. That before we could hang up, I'm sorry to say that I failed. I failed at listening. I failed at empathizing. All of my grace seemed to run away. I didn't have a lot of love to show. So, the trust that we had built up again and again, we are family, after 55 years, seemed to evaporate. I know that the work that I have to do on myself and with my family is different from the work that we have to do for our democracy, and yet it feels similar. So what am I hopeful for? 
Well, this week I joined a call, a webinar, with an organization called Braver Angels. You might have heard of it. It's a national citizens movement to bring liberals and conservatives together at the grassroots level. Not to find centrist compromise, but to quote, find one another as citizens. It helped me to be among all those people, over 4,000 in fact, who are working to find one another as citizens. I'm inspired to keep doing this work, to keep doing this work with you together, to hopefully be able to find my sister again, not just as a citizen, but as a sister. So no matter what it is that you are seeking here today, I hope that together we can find some grace, some patience, some joy, and to begin again to build trust with our families and our fellow citizens. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our poet for today, a Civic Saturday fellow, Hakeem Bellamy. Hello, thank you, Janae. I'm uh, coming to you all beaming in from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we send you greetings, bienvenidos, and uh, thank you for those amazing words. This poem is uh, just for, uh, just for, commission, first time, you guys are hearing it first, and it's uh, for this Civic Saturday, so um, I hope you enjoy. It's called Books to Swear By. Devoid the pomp and circumstance, the parades and crowds, the bands, balls, and applause. An inauguration is nothing but a presidential book club, a story we swear upon. Left hand on a text, right hand in the air, like the difference between an answer and a question maybe both. It is the called upon wedding of our aspirations to their ambitions, promising to be an open book, to be the cover our country is judged by. So the opportunity to select what binds us is both critical and revealing. Most go for a Bible, Washington's, Lincoln's, an heirloom, a conventional bet for a nation whose leaders are neither ordained nor descendant for a position more in need of prayer than a handbook. But there was that one time that John Quincy Adams used a book of law that included the constitution for his in 1825. If I may, a few suggestions. 1984, The Republic, Silent Spring, narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave, and Walden, because the presidency is an exile of sorts. De Tocqueville, Foucault, Sinclair, Said, Emmanuel Kant, Richard Wright, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Because a lot can be learned about a person depending upon what they do and do not read. Same goes for us as we do, as far as who we do and do not let lead. What if we were more about squares and circles than stars and stripes, sitting circular with perfect rectangles spread across our laps, open to random pages of one another? Week in and week out, chapters open, chapters close. Maybe an inauguration is just a novel to swear by that we actually get to write. Thank you, Hakeem. And now, um, Eric wrote to me and said I didn't introduce myself. I thought maybe I did, um, but in case I didn't, I am Janae Kane, co-founder of Citizen University. And now because of this wonderfully new way of gathering, um, we are going to bring back uh, one of my favorite things that we uh, do in person when we are able to gather in person, and that's called the turn and talk. Um, it's gonna be a moment for us to break out into groups of two or three and to have time to introduce ourselves and to just reflect a little bit and talk about um, this prompt that I'm gonna give you. Um, but just know that we're gonna take about six minutes to do this. So monitor yourselves and your breakouts um, when it's time to move on, uh, introduce yourself, listen to one another and uh, keep a little eye on the time. We're gonna take about six minutes. And um, what we wanna do is just talk about right now, um, share a little bit of those fears and those hopes um, that you wrote down. 
it's so good to be here with you all. And if my voice wavers, it's partly because I was so moved by the fears and hopes that I heard you share. And also because I'm in a very cold cabin in the woods of Ohio. So <laughs> I'm doing my best to stay warm, but feeling your presence here uh, with me as we're scattered across the country is just such a powerful thing. And I'm gonna sing a song today that I actually asked um, the Citizen University crew if I could sing this back in December and had no idea how relevant it would become today. And it was written by someone who possibly at the time of writing it felt very similar to how we're feeling today. Um, a lot of uncertainty and a lot of fear and also with an understanding that on the other side of that fear is the hope and the hope that Martin Luther King Jr. talked about during the civil rights movement where we could actually carve a stone of hope from a mountain of despair. And so I feel like it's an honor to get to play this song for you today. I hope it feels um, healing in this moment as it also um, just accepts the uncertainty that we're living in. This is by Bob Dylan. Come gather around people wherever you roam. And admit that the waters around you have grown and accepted that soon you'll be drenched to the bone. If your time to you is worth saving, well, you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone for the times they are a change. Come writers and critics who prophesize with your pen. Keep your eyes wide, the chance won't come again. And don't speak too soon, for the wheel's still in spin. There's no telling who that it's naming. For the loser now will be later to win, cause the times they are a change. Mothers and fathers all throughout the land. And don't criticize what you don't understand. Your sons and your daughters are beyond your command. The old road is rapidly aging. Please get out of the new one if you can't lend a hand. Cause the times, they are a change. The line it is drawn, the curse it is cast. The slow one now will later be fast. And the present now is soon to be past. The order is rapidly fading, and the first one now is soon to be last, for the times, they are a change. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Oh, oh, I just, I just wish we could actually hear the applause. I can feel it. I kind of can't remember what it feels like to be with people when we're all loving and appreciating and applauding something together, how that live experience feels. But this, I'm just going to say this is the next best thing and it's good. So thank you, Kate. Um, now I, it's time uh, to hear from two of our community members here who are going to share what we call civic scripture. And so um, here's a time uh, to listen. Uh, we may put it in the, uh, in the chat, um, but it's, it's a good time just to tune in and listen. Um, and we're going to have two readers today. The first one will be our friend Kaz Brescher and our second, our friend Sonia Lay. Uh, hi, my name is Sonia and I live on the traditional land of the Duwamish and Coast Salish people, uh, currently known as Seattle. And uh, I am reading today the preamble to the Constitution of the United States, ratified September 17th, 1787. 
we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Thank you, Sonia. Um, I'm Kaz Brescher. I am calling in from Los Angeles, which is the land that was stewarded by the Tongva and Chumash people for many years. Um, and I am reading from a speech called A Proper Sense of Priorities that was delivered by the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. on February 6th, 1968 in Washington, DC. Someone said to me not long ago, it was a member of the press, Dr. King, since you face so many criticisms and since you are going to hurt the budget of your organization, don't you feel that you should kind of change and fall in line with the administration's policy? Aren't you hurting the civil rights movement and people who once respected you may lose respect for you because you're involved in this controversial issue in taking this stand against the war? And I had to look with a deep understanding of why he raised the question and with no bitterness in my heart and say to that man, I'm sorry, sir, but you don't know me. I'm not a consensus leader. I don't determine what is right and wrong by looking at the budget of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, nor do I determine what is right and wrong by taking a Gallup poll of the majority opinion. Ultimately, a genuine leader is not a searcher of consensus, but a molder of consensus. On some positions, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but he must take it because conscience tells him it is right. Thank you, Kaz. Thank you, Sonia. Um, I want to thank again Hakeem Bellamy uh, and Kate Tucker, two of our um, Civic Saturday Fellows, uh, which means they've been trained in our Civic Seminary program uh, to lead Civic Saturday gatherings uh, of their own, uh, which they've been doing. Um, and in addition to that, they are remarkable citizen artists sharing the gifts of their poetry and song and voice. Uh, and we're just so grateful to both of them. And um, I'm so glad to be with all of you. Um, I got to join a turn and talk session and um, meet some new people. And I know you all did as well. And, um, and the way that Janae framed this day, um, I think was exactly right and was very moving to me to invite us, to force us, to prompt us to reckon with hope and fear in a way that didn't allow us to think too much, but just to share what was there. Because now we're called to sit with those things that we shared. And that's what I would like to do today in this civic sermon. 10 days ago, a violent, seditious mob overran the United States Capitol after the president had urged them to stop Congress from fulfilling its constitutional duty to confirm his defeat in the Electoral College. Can you believe I just said that? A notable word recurred through all the media coverage the day of the inauguration, I mean, of the insurrection. <laughs> Terrible Freudian slip. The word in that coverage was sacred. It was said that, quote, the sacred temple of our democracy had been desecrated, that the presence of white nationalists and Confederate flag-waving thugs in the rotunda had profaned, quote, our sacred seat of power. But what exactly is sacred about the Capitol? What do we mean when we call it a temple? We don't mean anything about the supernatural or a god. We certainly don't mean that the people we send there to represent us are gods to be venerated. We mean simply this. Democracy, government of, by, and for the people, is a freaking miracle. Democracy works only if enough of us believe democracy works. A mutual collective leap of faith 
in our constitution and in each other. That's all that separates our republic from anarchy or autocracy. So what we sacralize is not the building, we sacralize a creed. We sacralize a complicated history of deeds that have forced us to face that creed, sometimes by redeeming it, sometimes by betraying it. The Capitol is where reconstruction began and also where it was gutted, where the Civil Rights Act passed and the Chinese Exclusion Act. The stars and bars in the rotunda the Confederate flag has been on proud display in the Capitol for decades in the flags of all the Southern states that incorporated its design into their own. White supremacists were leading members of the first Congress in 1789 and of the 116th Congress that adjourned two weeks ago. When we say the Capitol is sacred, we mean our agreement to try to make this thing mean something is sacred to us. This gathering today is an expression of that faith. It is a collective act of sense-making and searching that is not about dogma and fundamentalist certitude, but is about asking ourselves always, how can we become America? How can we become the land of the free, the home of the brave, the place where the people rule, where we are created equal with liberty and justice for all? We hope that this still can be achieved even as we face mounting evidence that it can't. Evidence that we are a sick, weak, exploitable, divided, duty-shirking, sacrifice-allergic, strongman-curious mess of a people. Well, today, I hope to fortify our hope. I wanna talk about three dimensions of American civic life and civic religion that we are responsible for sustaining through this time of crisis. The Constitution, the conscience and the coalition. Start with the Constitution. How did you feel just a little while ago when Sonia read the words of the preamble as civic scripture? Actually, put it into, ch into the chat box how you felt. Curious to see some of your replies as you go. Brought tears to your eyes. Lucy was moved. Jim felt a sense of strength, pride, some chills. It's almost a prayer. Wow, Jenny, thank you. It's almost a prayer. Surprising emotion for something so rote, right? Aware of the contradictions in we the people. Hope, hope, renewed hope. Well, I'll tell you, as I heard it, I felt both the lift of idealism and the pull, the tug of realism. The events of the last two weeks have forced me to contemplate that preamble anew, to read it closely. And I realized reading it closely that most of the sentiments and ideas in it could actually be found in the preambles to the constitutions of many other countries. The constitution of the Soviet Union as amended in 1977 spoke of a quote, society of true democracy. The Constitution of the People's Republic of China, amended 2004, promises, quote, to turn China into a socialist country that is prosperous, powerful, democratic, and culturally advanced. Our words are more elegant than theirs, but form a more perfect union. The Soviets wanted that. Establish justice. That's what the Stasi said they were for. Ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare. The Communist Party of China over the last 50 years would say, check, check, and check. There is, however, one clause in our preamble that is not echoed by any totalitarian state. Secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. It doesn't say to enjoy the blessings of liberty, much less exploit them. It says secure them. And not just now, while we get to enjoy them, but forever. My representative in Congress, Pramila Jayapal, was stuck in that secure location with many members of Congress from both parties during the insurrection and lockdown. And as many of you know, the Republicans in that room refused to put on masks. And later Pramila and a few other Democrats, and Pramila's husband, by the way, 
got COVID. That secure location is a distillation of America in 2021. Two sides stuck together, no way out, and one side, a sociopathic minority, refuses, not on any coherent principle, but as a matter of twisted oppositional identity politics, refuses even in the face of what should be a unifying physical threat on the other side of the door, refuses to think about anyone else's safety, endangering everyone in the end. To exploit liberty is to refuse to wear a mask during a pandemic. To secure the blessings of liberty is to practice basic pandemic hygiene and common courtesy. To exploit liberty is to show up at a rally to overturn a free, fair, certified election, undermine the peaceful transfer of power, and then spin your sedition as free speech. To secure the blessings of liberty is to know that showing up at a rally for insurrection, even if you personally did not storm the Capitol, is crapping on the Constitution. What does it mean to secure the blessings of liberty and not just free ride off of everyone else? It means you take responsibility for what's broken, steward what's good, cultivate civic virtue, sacrifice short-term gain for the greater good over the longer haul. During the ratification debate in Virginia, the anti-federalist Patrick Henry quarreled with the phrasing, we the people. He said it should read, we the states. But the defenders of the constitution pointed out that the people are sovereign, not the states and that the Articles of Confederation had failed and a more perfect union was now needed precisely because after the revolution, the states had been too much at odds with one another, too selfish, and the people of all the states had suffered as a result. Give me liberty or give me death, Patrick Henry once said. But if all you do is demand liberty, you will in fact get death. COVID has taught us that. Union secures the blessings of liberty. And if you won't put in the work of maintaining union, your liberty is but a rumor. The most indelible profanity of January 6th, the greatest desecration comes not from the literal defecation on the floor, not from the trespassers taking selfies from the speaker's chair, nor even from that Confederate flag. The greatest desecration is that the marauders and their enablers committed their violence in the name of the American Revolution. This is 1776, tweeted Lauren Boebert, junior congresswoman from QAnon. What a joke. The fetish that the Trumpist right has made of tyranny talk and militia cosplay is in inverse proportion to their understanding of what it takes to hold together a mass multiracial democratic republic. But of course, that's the thing. They don't want a mass multiracial democratic republic. They want a private white autocratic fatherland. 2021 isn't 1776. It's closer to 1787, when you needed grown-ups who knew that keeping a republic is harder than declaring a revolution. Or 1869, when the Reconstruction Amendments to the Constitution were ratified, slavery banished, the slave made a citizen, and our country founded anew. Or 1965, when the Voting Rights Act became, a, became law a year after the Civil Rights Act, and we had what you can think of as the third founding of the United States after Reconstruction. Every one of those foundings, by the way, was followed by backlash and backsliding. Let's get real. As I said about the preamble, words are just words. Shared meaning and common purpose are so easy to obliterate so hard to restore. Before we can make words mean something again now, before we can literally make people face facts, we have to rebuild trust and relationship. We have to restore an ethical core to our society. Which brings me to the second dimension I want to explore today, conscience. A lot of people on the left in recent days have said, to hell with Joe Biden's, Joe Biden's messages of unity and empathy. Enough of the profiles of Trump voters and diners in distressed rural towns. After what happened last week, they say, we need accountability. To which I say, you bet we do. I called early for Trump's removal by the 25th Amendment or by impeachment. 
And I hope that the insurrectionist members of Congress are removed by section three of the 14th amendment, which was written after the civil war to keep proven traitors out of the United States government. But here's the thing, accountability and empathy are not mutually exclusive, particularly for the people who are followers rather than ringleaders. Understanding does not preclude judgment or consequences. Accountability that lasts, in fact, arises from connection rather than coercion. It comes from a contagion of conscience, an awakening of an inner voice that is made more possible when the person whose conscience is being stirred can find some refuge in relationship. Now, I know the dude with the horns and the fur cape in the Capitol, Congresswoman Boebert of QAnon, Josh Hawley, Camp Auschwitz sweatshirt guy, not everyone who should be punished can also be redeemed. And not everyone who stormed the Capitol, cheered the insurrection, abetted the sedition, or stood by sympathetically is worth your empathic capacity. But some of them are, because you are kin to some of them. I know I am. This is the power of thinking about conscience. It reduces the vast scale of things to a single human heart. What most challenged me in today's wonderful piece of scripture from Martin Luther King Jr. was when he said, quote, and I had to look deep, and I had to look with a deep understanding of why he raised the question, and with no bitterness in my heart. Why did King make a point of saying that? The rest of what he said was the quotable stuff, the good righteous drawing of lines between cowardice, expediency, vanity, and conscience. But as much the teacher as the preacher, King was modeling for us a moment of self-examination, a breath of doubt before a rebuttal, a desire to understand rather than win, and, there, and therefore possibly to connect. My teammate at Citizen University, Athena Higgins, many years ago was in a cult called the Boston Movement. She talks about it openly. When I asked her recently how she and her husband left, how anyone ever manages to exit a cult, she spoke of the cognitive dissonance that sets in, the gap between the story from the great leader and their lived experience, the constant energy drain of shutting reality out. But that fatigue alone was not enough to impel her to leave. It took a relationship, a friend she could trust, who was a safe haven with whom she could voice her doubts out loud without judgment. The normalizing of abuse is what leads so many to a cult, Athena says, and then the normalizing of a new cycle of abuse is what traps them there. The hurt, the yearning to heal. Janae astutely observed that perhaps the most notable thing Trump said on January 6th when he finally told the insurrectionists to stand down was not about politics, safety, or right or wrong. It was this, go home, we love you, you're very special. It's not for a president to heal our damaged hearts, even if the president were someone you could look up to. It's for us as citizens to do that for each other as much as we safely can. Now, I do not believe that all 75 million of the Americans who voted for Trump want to be in a personality cult come death or destruction. Let's say, very conservatively, that 95% of them only want to be in that cult. That still leaves almost 4 million Americans whose consciences can be stirred enough to bring them back to reality. Not to the Democrats, not to the left, just to reality, where they will have to take responsibility for their choices. Janae and I have been voraciously reading a recent book by Susan Neiman called Learning from the Germans. It's a, com it's a comparison of how Germany since the Nazis and the US since slavery have each dealt with their respective foundational sins. It's about whether and in what circumstances a person and a people can take responsibility. That distinction between a person and a people was illuminated in a passage from that book about the president of West Germany who in 1985 made a landmark speech reframing the anniversary of Germany's defeat in World War II as Liberation Day. This was a big departure from the posture of victimization and blame shifting 
that Germans of the war generation had adopted. What he was saying was the end of the war liberated Germans who had participated in Nazism from Nazism. This reframing of the narrative made the German people agents of their own liberation. It's akin to the argument that unwinding white supremacy in the United States today does more than help black and other non-white Americans. It also liberates whites. But the sobering addendum to that passage is that the same West German president who committed this act of public conscience could not muster the same when it came to his personal life. He could never speak with moral clarity about the choice his father had made to be a senior Nazi official or the fact of his father's post-war execution by the allies. Sometimes conscience is gummed up by the personal. Sometimes we must go bigger. And this is why I wanna close my sermon today with some thoughts on the third dimension of civic life, coalition. The Trump years have been marked by a different C word, by rampant conspiracy. Conspiracy theories about the deep state, the meta conspiracy theory of QAnon, and then the actual conspiracy to create a big lie about Biden stealing the election, followed by another actual conspiracy to steal the election from Biden and undermine the legitimate government of the United States, a conspiracy that may yet lead to the expulsion of members of Congress. But these years have also been defined by relentless coalition, the joining of sometimes strange bedfellows, ranging from Bernie Sanders to Bill Kristol, AOC to Lisa Murkowski, to hold the line against autocracy. Coalition is the antidote to conspiracy. We have a shining bright example of that in Georgia. It's so unfortunate that the story of the two US Senate races in Georgia has been pushed off the front page. In a slightly less insane world, every day's news would be deconstructing those victories, telling how super organizers like Ensei Ufat of the New Georgia Project and the state legislator B. Wynn, and of course their field general Stacey Abrams and an army of others brought new young voters and new voters of color to the ballot box. Those would be the profiles and the beat by beat pieces in the news, rather than the Instagram sleuthing of white supremacists. And that tale of coalition would also tell how a Republican Secretary of State in the end did hold the line and create moral space for Republican voters of conscience to get off the train of the cult. Coalition turns conspiracy inside out. Where conspiracy secretly advances a crime, coalition works openly for goals you're not ashamed of. Coalition replaces a theory of faraway powers who control your life with the practice of your own power to change your life. Coalition breeds restraint and compromise instead of unbounded permission to lie and justify. Coalition feeds on information and fact. Conspiracy on misinformation and fiction. These last few years, I was part of a group of leaders, writers and activists, many of whom I think are just flat wrong on many policy issues. But we banded together to defend democracy, to defend our mutual right, to fight out our differences the way the constitution intended. When Georgia showed America on January 5th, what jo Georgia showed America on January 5th is that it is possible to build a cross-region, cross-race, cross-religion, cross-ideology, cross-generation coalition of courage, of conscience, of constructive citizen power, of democratic faith. Remember January 5th. Kate Tucker, who has led us in song today, also helps lead an organization called Brightheart in Nashville, Tennessee. I'll never forget when Kate said to me once, in response to the conventional wisdom, she said, we don't know if Tennessee is a red state. We do know it's a non-voting state. The same can be said of every state in the United States. When a third of eligible voters don't vote in even the best of years, and 80% don't vote in a typical local election, every jurisdiction in our country is a potential proving ground for a coalition of people who want the rule of law and democratic self-government. In this time of 1850s style creeping disunion 
and 1950s style McCarthyite paranoia, you might be tiring of talk of us and them. But even under less fraught circumstances, humans are always wired to split the world into us and them. So at Citizen University, we teach that civic religion properly understood offers the healthiest possible way to do that. The us is those who wish to serve, volunteer, vote, listen, learn, empathize, argue better, circulate power rather than hoard it, and accept the rule of law and the idea that democracy is a game of infinite repeat play in which you sometimes lose. The them is those who don't. It is possible to judge the them harshly, but it's not always necessary. For at any time, one of them can become one of us simply by choosing to live like a citizen. So we need to welcome more people in. This coalition for democratic citizenship at home is as necessary today as the creation of NATO was 75 years ago. Now we must contain and shrink the anti-democratic, the illiberal, and the authoritarian inside our borders. What can a parent do, a neighbor, a gig worker, a manager, a teacher, an artist, a child? What can each of us do to expand that coalition? Well, that's what we're actually gonna ask you in a moment. But we know this much, you can't do any of this alone. Learn the constitution, learn the arguments inside it and know your own mind. Use every tool you have, intellectual and emotional, to awaken the conscience of people and of the people. Commit to the idea and the practice of coalition, hard and uncomfortable and dissatisfying as it may sometimes be. We have a long way to go, my friends, before we arrive at America. Let's carry each other there. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Let's begin our coalition by raising our voices in song together. This is a song that we all know well that may seem strange to sing in moments like this, but we're gonna do a newer interpretation of it thanks to Buffy St. Marie. This is America the Beautiful. Please join me wherever you are in singing the chorus. There were Choctaws in Alabama, Chippewas in St. Paul, Mississippi blood runs like a river in me. Oh, America, she's like a mother to me. spacious skies for amber waves of gray for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain America America God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea from sea to shining sea there was salmon running in seattle pyramids in illinois trade routes up and down the mississippi river to sea oh america She's like a mother to me. Oh, beautiful for vision clear that sees beyond the years. Our nighttime sky, our hopes that fly undimmed by human tears. America, America, God shed his grace on thee, till selfish gain no longer stain the banner of the free, and crown thy 
good with brother and sisterhood from sea to shiny sea. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, everyone who was singing along. Kate, that was beautiful. Got me a little teary eyed. Uh, but I also got to enjoy singing by myself that I don't always do with other people. And that's always a little bit of a joy. Um, but I do really enjoy being with other people, which is a segue to what we're going to do next. Um, we're bringing back Civic Circles as this main part of our Civic Saturday. Um, let me tell you what Civic Circles are. Um, it's a time to engage with each other so you can process and digest what we've been feeling, talking, and thinking. Um, we hope that you turn on your video if you are able. Uh, so that we can help improve the experience for everyone. You know, a large part of Civic Saturday in these circles um, is to provide a space where we can make sense of this moment we're in um, and to do that with one another after all the time we've just spent with each other. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity. So we're going to break out into groups of about four to six this time. Um, we're going to take about 15 minutes and here are the ground rules, pretty simple. Introduce yourself, uh, introduce where you are, and really uh, make sure that you share both your voice and your ears. Make sure everyone gets a chance to speak once before you speak twice um, on Zoom. Maybe um, if it works to stay unmuted, but to give people a little heads up if you have something to say once we've all had a chance to speak. Um, listen to hear and not to react um, and really try and understand one another. And here's the prompt uh, that we want you to discuss. How can you help expand the Coalition for Democracy? It is once again time to hear from our wonderful poet and Civic Saturday fellow, Hakeem. This particular poem is it's really hitting a theme that's been brought up a few times. Um, and I'm reminded by our friends who read the civic scripture to also say, um, Bienvenidos from Albuquerque, we're on Tiwa land. Tiwa is the land of the indigenous folks that, that live here before it was long before it was Albuquerque. So I wanna add that. Um, and um, I also wanna, I wanna lean into Dr. King, you know, his birthday was yesterday. Um, the holiday is Monday, and um, in my homework and research and learning about Dr. King, it felt like he was on a trajectory to one day, you know, possibly being an elected official, possibly taking an oath of office of sorts, but we were, we were denied that opportunity with him as a country, but definitely a public servant, um, someone who's give, gave his life to um, the betterment of the country, right, not just advancements for, for civil rights, but of course, towards the end there, more about um, fighting poverty and war. So I, uh, I get the pleasure every year of writing a poem on MLK Day that I do at a local high school, Amy Beal High School, which does a day of service on his birthday. And they're figuring out a way to do it virtually this year. And um, this was a poem I wrote for him a few years ago in 2014. Um, and, uh, and also had the opportunity to share with even younger audiences. So the idea was that what if I could talk to Dr. King as a nine-year-old and I could ask him a question, nine, him questions nine-year-old to nine-year-old. And so that's kind of the framing of the poem and uh, as you'll see, but I really feel like as far as uh, its connection to a Civic Saturday that, that, there, that there are more answers in the questions. Um, that's, that's really our key is to just like realize we don't know everything and lean into the things we can learn from other folks. And that's why we, that's why we gather and rebuild democracy every day. So here's a few questions for Dr. King. It's called Ageless. How old were you when you realized that black was your favorite color because it was the absence of color? Or so you were taught in elementary school, even though it was right there plain as day in a Crayola box. How old were you when your teacher started teaching you not to see it? You made a habit of seeing things, things that other people would pretend not seeing like crayons, like people 
like dreams. All the things you really wanted to believe in, like the absence of color and people. How old were you when you fell in love with Star Trek, when you realized the only people who could see the future in color besides you were in a spaceship on TV? How old were you when you learned that two pieces of wood can make a cross and fire on your front lawn at the same time? How old are you when they stopped calling you Michael? How old are you when they stopped calling you names? How come we're never old enough? How come it never stops? How did 14 feel? Did it feel like 39 or zero when the bus driver made you give up your seat? Did it feel like prodigy or payback when you went to college at 15 so they'd stop calling you boy? How old were you when you realized you wanted to be Gandhi instead of governor when all your peers still wanted to be policemen and you? You wanted to be a preacher. How many people can say they had a president phone them in prison? How big was that opening number at the premiere of Gone with the Wind? How bad did you want to sing it? How old were you when you finally did? How much more fun is that than being shot at? How come I love musicals too? How come adrenaline is adrenaline and we do what we got to do? How old were you when pecan pie became your favorite meal, when the ideal breakfast menu consisted of cake and eat it too? How old were you when you decided starving was the best way to get your point across? When you decided sitting down at a lunch counter and not eating was the best way to stand up for yourself? How old were you when you started crying for no reason? How old were you when you discovered the monster under your bed was really the FBI under your phone when the breathing on the other end was real and the voices, well, the voices were yours? How old were you when you tried to stop the voices? How old were you when you saw the elephant and realized your country apartheid it out the room? What age were you when your love became a four letter word and your skin a profanity that was impossible to clean. How old were you when they told you you were too old for imaginary friends, especially when you imagine having friends a different color than green? How old were you when they decided you were old enough? How old were they when you decided you were too young to leave? How old were you when they told you wake up king, stop dreaming? And even after you stop breathing, we could still see it, no matter how old we get. Thank you, Hakeem. Just gonna give everybody a minute to let that sink in. That was just wonderful. So glad you share that with kids every year. I'm so thankful that you've just shared that with us. I have chill bumps. I don't think I'm the only one. Whew. My feeling tells me just to say goodbye because nothing else needs to be said. But I do need to say one more thing. Kate and Hakeem are C Civic Saturday Fellows. They've taken part in a training and they are part of a wonderful, amazing group of people um, who have gone through this training who are leading Civic Saturdays in their own communities. And so if you're feeling, what can I do? Where's my coalition? Maybe you need to apply to the Civic Saturday Fellowship. Applications are open right now. You can go to our website, citizenuniversity.us and apply. Send the link to someone you know that should apply and start one of these in your own community and see what happens from there. Um, it's a beautiful experience. You will make great friends. And then you can share this with your friends. And that's how we begin again. So I'm just gonna say goodbye. Um, there's one little thing you can do right here at the end if your candle is still burning. We can blow it out together. So I'm gonna count down from three to two, to one, in just a moment. And then we can just turn off our lights and look out. Three, two, one. I always like to do that. And if you want one more thing to do after we say goodbye, it's a new little ritual I've started in my life, just to every day, take a little note from Ben Franklin and write down what good will I do today? So say goodbye, 
to each other and take a moment to write down what good will I do today? Thank you everyone and goodbye.